Okay, hello and welcome to Nitro Nights episode five with me, Tom Deacon. Now this is the show for all of your esports racing needs. We give you the lowdown on everything that's happening as we look at the tournaments taking place. And we also talk to the drivers from the sim world. We get their tips on success. Three episodes a week with a brand new guest in each show. What's not to like? Do it now, subscribe so you never miss an episode. And better still, plus you should follow us on Twitter so that you're up to date with all of the latest. Right, uh, I'm ready in my lounge-based studio. Let's get to it. Let's kickstart things with the news flash. Now, what a weekend of action it was. It was quite frankly brilliant. We start with the real racers never quit and round six is done and dusted. As you can see there, Max Verstappen has been crowned the champion. 35 racers lined up this weekend at Suzuka on iRacing. Six wins out of 10 for Max going into this. He just needed one more win potentially potentially uh, in the last two races. However, Kelvin van der Linde got in his way and he won both races from pole. Uh, great to see this for Max though, after his PC crash in Interlagos. Uh, moving on, the race All-Star Cup um, was taking place the NOLA Motorsport Park, Avondale, Louisiana on the R Factor 2. Uh, McLaren Shadow project winner Kevin Siggy. Siggy started from pole position in both the Sim Racing Heat and the Grand Final. And as you can see there, the results were in and congratulations to Kevin Ziggy. Um, as we can also see a fantastic overtake uh, from a former guest in episode four. For the final podium position, sends it to the outside. Oh. And he's pulled it off. Yovsky's going to try and hang in there. But I think Van Buren's got it. What a great move on the final lap by Rudy Van Buren. But it's Kevin Siggy who out of the final corner wins the race. All-Star Esports Cup, fully charged by... It was a brilliant overtake there for Rudy Van Buren. Uh, if you did miss episode four, where we interviewed him uh, to get all of his insights, uh, then make sure you go back and watch it. Um, also taking place in the same circuit that weekend was the Legends Trophy. Uh, Ferrari legend Rubens Barrichello uh, got a win under his belt, and so did Jan Magnussen, the four-time 24-hour Le Mans winner. So uh, great uh, R-Factor action for you. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, moving on, the F1 Vietnam Virtual Grand Prix that uh, I can't remember who who hosted that? Oh yeah, that was right. It was me. Uh, brilliant scenes. There was some chicane chaos though, as you can see here. Jimmy Broadbent once again proving adept at making his way through the field and spinning round there. And that's not what the Red Bull needed. Alexander Albon heading backwards. He's not the only one with a Toro Rosso heading off. Everyone's suffering from that. There you go. Uh, brilliant commentating from Jack Nichols and, of course, Alex Jakes there you, you heard. Uh, so a brilliant six F1 2020 drivers taking part in that race. It was epic. Eventually, though, it did go to the winner, Charles Leclerc, who had only been sim racing for eight days. This has been absolutely faultless from Leclerc. Didn't take part, so this is going to be on debut as well, sending it round the final corner. Done. Charles Leclerc across the line to win the virtual Grand Prix in Australia. Very impressive drive from Leclerc. 10.2 seconds ahead of Christian Lungard at the end of the race. George Russell will come across the line in third place, I think. And actually, Arthur Leclerc has really closed in this last lap or so. Russell starting to struggle. The Williams just coming into the left-hander and out across the line. Oh, my knees, everything is... I gave everything, guys. Brilliant. Uh, Charles Leclerc there. He gave everything. And you know what? He has the bragging rights well, over uh, the other F1 drivers that were taking part. Uh, Lando Norris's uh, PC crash. Unfortunately, he didn't take part. But George Russell finishing in third. Um, listen, I need to mention the F1 Esports Pro exhibition uh, that had the F1 Esports Pro Series uh, drivers who are getting ready for 2020. Uh, a fantastic win for Freddie Rasmussen in the Red Bull. David Tunitzer, the 2019 champion in the FDA who Esports team. He came in second.
Hamilton and Floris Byers, a guy that didn't have the best 2019 season in Haas, finishing third. Special mention to Lucas Blakely, though, uh, in the e-racing sport, went from P19 to P5. Make sure you definitely check out that race, end-to-end -end stuff. Um, moving on to the Porsche Mobile One Super Cup. Uh, it is a fantastic race. Uh, Porsche 911 GT3 Cup racers on the track. And don't forget, $200,000 on the line. Brilliant moment uh, between Larry Tenvorda and Einchan Guven. And this was an end-to-end -end stuff in the first race that uh, Vorda actually won. Out the chicane, not really a very good overtaking opportunity unless you fire it down the inside. Tenvorda goes defensive again. Oh. Guven tries to go around the outside. No contact between the two. And Larry Tenvorda has survived an onslaught of attacks from the Turkish driver to win the first race of the Mobile One Super Cup Virtual Edition in Barcelona. So congratulations to Larry Tenvorda winning the first race there in the Porsche Mobile One Super Cup uh, Virtual Edition. Uh, moving on to race two that happened. Don't forget, these are two races out of eight. Uh, as you can see uh, from the results, uh, Ayan Chan Guven, the winner of that race, which means at the end of the two races, Ayan Chan Guven and Larry Tenvorda are joint top in first place with 45 points. And Dylan Pereira is your third driver uh, or technically second, however you want to look at it, with 34 points. So there you go. Weekend of action. Enough done and dusted with the news flash. It's time to welcome our episode five guest. And it's none other than it's David Perrell. So joining me now, David, uh, welcome to Nitro Nights. Uh, how are you doing, sir? Oh, very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Looking forward to this little chat about some racing and all things virtual, I suppose. Yeah, indeed. I feel bad. I didn't give a wave back, so I'm just giving uh, the wave back it's now. Uh, currently, I can South see African some trophies. Uh, <laughs> I can see some trophies in the background there, David. Uh, nice to. I think this time, currently, people love to look at other people's setups. Uh, they're, they're going. Is this where your rig is as well? Uh, yeah, my rig is here. Um, this used to just be a sort of uh, trophy room, if you say, if you will. Um, I just had nowhere to put them, and recently, I installed these these shelves and stuff around me. Because uh, they were just kind of gathering dust on the floor. So I yeah. wanted to fix that. So now you can see them slightly in the background of this moody setting. Um, but yeah, I I like to keep my trophies. Not every racing driver does that. Um, but for me, that's yeah. it's the memory. That's why I go racing, actually. Yeah, well, no racing driver ever keeps the champagne. That's all the wasted, uh, in my humble opinion. Uh, listen, David, uh, to introduce it's you to the... Champagne. To the <laughs> is it not okay uh <laughs> listen to introduce you to to uh, nitro nights uh viewers um you said have said simulators are to racing drivers what treadmills are to runners it's not quite the real thing but you're still running now i think that's a fantastic uh, uh way of looking at sim racing but let's just give a little background uh in your sim experience and, and tell us a little bit about your driving experience too yeah, sure. So um, I've been a massive racing fan my whole life. I was literally almost born with a helmet on my head. Like the, one of the first photos of me is of me wearing my dad's motorbike helmet um, when I was like three years old. And around the age of 15, um, I started karting. Uh, mm -hmm. I begged my father for a kart and he agreed to help me for three years to pay for the karting. Not a lot. In South Africa, it wasn't that expensive at the time. I mean, my kart was less than 200 pounds. So... I uh, did that till I was 18 and then started to pay for it myself, um, became pretty serious, pretty decent at it, got to the world finals in Rotax, uh, finished sixth there, and then ran out of money when I was 23. That was sort of my peak. Um, so then started a business and always with the intention of coming back to racing. This is the simple story, basically. Uh, and seven years later, I'd saved enough to do one GT race in Italy. I cold called racing teams from South Africa. Um, one of them gave me a, a shot. I still had to pay a, a huge amount of money for it. Um, mm. And yeah, it, it went really well. And sort of that was uh, in 2014, at the end of 2014. Uh, and then it kind of went from there. The following year, I did Italian GT. And now I race for customer Ferrari teams um, around the world, basically. And mm. yeah, yeah. Uh, my sim racing started before my real racing started with Gran Turismo one. That was really when I started to 
enjoy using the PlayStation to uh, to drive. And then because of karting, I only had a there was only one kart track where I grew up, and it was an hour an hour away from us, so I couldn't really get there very often. So I I figured out then when I was about fifteen or sixteen. I could use Gran Turismo at the time to learn how to learn racetracks because I knew that when I was going to go to national events, I didn't have the, the experience of going around other tracks. So yeah, around the age of 15 or 16, I was, I was already figuring out that I wasn't calling them simulators, but I was saying, calling them racing games. You could use a racing game to improve your real driving. Mm. And and I suppose that that's where that uh, uh, quote that I take comes from. That but you're still you're still racing, and 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 that's the important thing. It, it's it's great to hear your journey uh, there, David. And and obviously knowing how it involved you are in the sim racing. I saw this weekend uh, you were taking part in the Loris Sport hashtag Race for Good. Uh, how did how did you get on with that, David? Oh, it was heartbreaking. It was absolutely heartbreaking. <laughs> no, so and in, this is why I'm bringing race... it up for the entertainment. <laughs> Yeah. In the first race, I calibrated my clutch wrong during qualifying. Uh, so I qualified last or something like that, but we finished uh, seventh. So and, and in each round, there was a, the bottom five got knocked out. So anyway, I made it into the second round and um, there was a big crash at the start. I avoided that and then got involved in another crash, which damaged my engine. So I was kind of, I was literally crawling, crawling around the track four seconds off the pace. And but still in 14th, the top 15 went through in that one. And on the final lap, I had engine failure. So I was livid. Yeah, it was so I, frustrating because, you know, I think also because I live stream all of my my racing, my sim racing, it, it raises the stakes a bit, which makes me less sort of nonchalant or lazy about it. Because when I drive on my own, I think it's human nature. We just, we just tend to not take it as seriously. So streaming in front of people and then that happens, I don't know, it, it makes it frustrating. It makes it feel worth something, even though it's, we're just playing games. And I, I never forget that. I got over it within about 30 minutes, but I still it still took me 30 minutes. Um, mm. But it's a shame because I think um, the final round was going to be at Monza in the Porsche 911 RSR. And I knew that we could have done a top five at that track with that car. So... That's why I was frustrated more than anything. And anyway, who, who enjoys having an engine failure on the last lap when you've crawled this car home into, into the qualification zone? I thought a miracle was about to happen. I was, anyway, that's just one but, of but many. On to the, the next cool one. Thing about, on to the next one. On to the next that's one. The that's all you, you can say. Rest- yeah, you just hit restart. In real life, geez, it's, it's, it's weeks of agony. So, yeah, it's all good. Um, I, I saw a quote uh, at the weekend as well from Talk Esports president and CEO Darren Cox. He said, "Esports at the moment is filling a vacuum uh, caused by COVID nineteen situation, but they're working hard to ensure there's massive growth in the esports popularity and making sure it's not just a temporary thing." Um, how do you feel about this this sort of stake at the moment in sim racing? It, it they don't want it to be just something to fill the time. We want to boost it and obviously i know and uh you're with your coaching you want this to to propel the the sim racing world on yeah so first of all sim racing is having its moment now if you compare it to other esports it's been missing something uh so there's definitely been uh, a moment where we couldn't we just if you looked at like league of legends and the prize money and the, the audience sizes that they had i mean sim racing just couldn't compare it was a footnote. Mm. And now there's been a, well, the th- whole thing is that the whole motorsport industry needs sim racing right now because they have nothing to report on. There's nothing to broadcast. There's nothing for the teams to do, nothing for the drivers to do. So they need sim racing to keep themselves busy. And there's some people, some companies who, I, I don't want to say lucky enough, it was just a matter of time, but let's just use that word for now, um, who were in the right position at the right moment to capitalize on it, mm. uh, which I think has been awesome. I still think there's a lot to be done though, because for example, some of the real racing drivers are still treating it like a game. I don't, mm. I don't necessarily blame them for that. So that you could argue that in some races, the quality of the driving hasn't been up to scratch. Mm. Um, but um, to be honest, I have a, there's valid reasons around that which would take another hour to explain but um uh 
my one worry at the moment is that we we kind of in a little bit of a bubble uh, mm. because I know for sure in July, July, August, when the calendars reopen, when racing gets back to it, we're going to be back to back until December, all of us yeah. drivers. We won't have the time, the energy, the mental capacity to spend our free Monday and Tuesday uh, to do some racing because the rest of the time we will be traveling. Forget the racing itself. We're obviously all looking forward mm. to that, but it's the travel which murders us mentally. Mm. Um, yeah. And usually I, a lot of us agree that, you know, you get home from a, a real race on a Sunday, your adrenaline, your adrenal glands literally have dumped everything. You have nothing left and you spend Monday just trying to recover and realize that you're a human being um, and you don't want to see a simulator on Monday. Um, so that's going slightly off topic, but the point is, how do we keep it interesting until then? Now, at the moment, what I see is a land grab, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of racing events, a lot of racing teams, a lot of sim racing teams who are trying to establish their name and, and build an audience around their, their Twitch or YouTube channels. Um, so it's quite competitive. There's you could argue right now a bit too much going on to keep up for all of us. Mm. Definitely as a sim racer myself, I, I, you know, I made two critical errors this last week because I got confused between two interfaces um, because iRacing is so different to ACC and the button mapping is also quite different. So I forgot to but refuel the car because it was the same button as push to talk. Yeah, but you so, don't want to miss out on these races as well. And, and that's exactly. the situation. Um, but but yes. taking on board, I know, and I've seen quite a few tweets uh, from yourself, uh, David, I want to talk about Gran Turismo because that's another yes. format uh, where you don't want to get into a bubble. And I feel like Gran Turismo Sport has been in a bubble, but finally uh, they've tweaked some, situ uh, some, some things in the game uh, due to the complaints. So I just want to talk about the current state of, of Gran Turismo. Let, let's, let's home in on that for a second. Uh, sure. wh what have been your issues with it, David? So Gran Turismo is the famous, is the favorite punching bag of many sim races. Um, mm. And I've been guilty of it myself. So there's a couple of things to consider. First of all, culturally, where Gran Turismo comes from. Okay, first of all, I'm not an apologist for Gran Turismo. I do have my, my issues. But anyway, mm. I just want to start here so we can understand the different aspects. Um, if you've ever worked uh, with a Japanese company or at least a Japanese racing team, um, their yeses, sorry, their noes look like yeses. Mm. So okay. did you understand that? And they'll go, yes, and they'll nod. And you'll be like, oh, no, he definitely didn't get that. But also the way that they take on feedback, the way that they incorporate changes is a much more patient and longer process than what we have mm. in the Western world. And that's a mm. cultural thing because they're dedicating their whole lives to perfecting their art and craft. Um, mm. So... If you uh, give them feedback based on a bug or whatever, I'm, I mean, I'm obviously making some assumptions here, but I can tell you now they go, mm, we don't have enough data to validate that yet. And it feels like with Gran Turismo Sport, my, my perception of what's going on here is this is a massive data acquisition tool for them to make Gran Turismo 7 on the PS5, where yeah. I think for the first time, they're going to have enough computing power to build in the physics that they need. I don't know if to take on ACC and iRacing, but at least to get much closer. Because mm. with the PlayStation, for example, you're limited by the performance of the, the machine and you have to make a lot of assumptions in the programming um, for it to act realistically. And mm. a good example is how different a set of Corsa feels on a PlayStation versus how it feels on a PC. There's more computing power. All that being said, there are some serious issues in Gran Turismo. For one, the penalty system just seems to get worse instead of better. And I don't know why, I don't know why that hasn't been addressed. And there's mm. been some weird reactionary changes lately, which is very unlike Gran Turismo in that the, the penalties would be too severe and then they would just turn off the penalties as a reaction to fan feedback. Um, and that's just not the way they used to act. So that's interesting. Mm. What's interesting is they are definitely starting to take on more fan feedback. Could it be a reaction yeah. to the fact that we're seeing this explosion in sim racing now um, and they don't want to lose the audience because they see us going to iRacing and stuff? 
possibly. Maybe. Um, so they're reacting too quickly. I mean, they, they're going to release a huge update coming soon, which has reduces the effects of slipstreams, finally gets rid of fuel burning and qualifying, we hope, we think. Um, and is this going to be, that's the sport mode uh, update, isn't it? Uh, correct. David, the FIA races. Happen. But, but interesting enough, and I think this is very interesting because you're basically saying that, that, that currently the community is like, they haven't listened before, but they have. They've just been storing all of that data to then act on it. Whereas now it seems very so. reactionary. But then looking yeah. at your tweet, and I'd just like to look at this for a second, because I think it's good in a community that you have a, a very open uh, debate and topic. Uh, these are your top complaints. And I like that you've put them, you've categorized them. Uh, <laughs> number one, limited entries. Two, intense qualifying uh, schedule. Uh, no prize money, no social life. But you, you carry on. And I think this is really interesting because you, uh, let's be clear, does not owe you anything. And I think that's the best thing right now is to say it doesn't owe you anything. However, people playing these games and pushing themselves and doing exactly what you uh, you you preach and talk about in your driver, uh, David's Academy, it is you're pushing yourself and having that gr grit and determination. You still need to fix those bugs, but it's finding the right balance. Yeah, so um, I got into a lot of hot water over these tweets because, I mean, okay, if, especially if I consider my story of where I came from to become a racing driver, took every ounce of determination and sacrifice, um, both, you know, on the emotional side, physical side, financially, the mm -hmm. whole deal. And then when I see some sim racers saying they don't want to compete in, in, uh, Gran Turismo events because there's no prize money. I'm like, well, who are you? You know, we, we're mm -hmm. not big enough yet to, to be at a level where we're demanding appearance fees, for example. If, if you look at League of Legends, I understand why those guys are getting so much money. They are pulling in crowds of the hundreds of thousands, those teams and those players. Um, mm. In the sim racing world, we still, we're still trying to get there. You know, the biggest events at the moment are the ones with real racing drivers in the sim world. Mm. Those are the ones where we get a, very excited about what's going on. Um, then the limited entries thing, people, a lot of people are complaining about certain countries which are more competitive getting the same amount of entries as a country that's not competitive um so it means that i'm just going to use an example <laughs> turkey the the guy who wins in turkey is going to have a much easier time than the guy who has to win in italy but that's that's the nature of life that's the olympics the olympics is like mm. that as well and the way i perceive the gt sport events is more akin to olympics than it is to uh, I don't know, Formula One, um, because in Gran Turismo, you, you're not even allowed to wear your sponsor's T-shirt or anything like that on your logos, I mean. But that's the nature of that game. You don't have to play it. But the thing with Gran Turismo, at least, is there's 9 million active users or registered users in that game. So if you don't want to, with your talent, come and play the game, then by all means, go play iRacing or ACC. That's fine. But there's going to be someone who's equally talented and is willing to take those certain sacrifices um, and move on to the next thing. So, I don't know. I, I have strong opinions about it. Um, a lot of people gave me a hard time, but I still feel fundamentally like if you don't want to do this race, that's fine. But complaining that you don't get rewarded for it, that's not Gran Turismo's fault. They're giving you the platform to go to the next level. I think that's uh, beautifully put, David. And uh, I, I really just feel, and I'm sure people watching this are feeling your passion as well, which is this is what we all love about uh, e-racing. We, we love that. So um, hopefully we see more of it. Um, I, I did want to double check with you um, uh, before I get to the quick fire round, which I don't think I told you about. Uh, obviously, working with a GT3 engineer, Chris Retos, uh, that's part of your coach uh, coaching on your, on your Dave Academy. Uh, just to explain that to people, how important do you think it is to have a coach to improve your skills in the sim world? Yeah, so what happened was uh, at the middle of last year, I started to realize, I do real life coaching. A lot of professional drivers do that. That's how we earn money on top of racing. Um, and I realized, I was like, why can't I cross this over to guys in the sim world who want real coaching? They take this seriously. Um, they spend a lot of money on rigs and stuff. Um, so let me try and impart my knowledge. So I slowly started to, I created this Coach Dave brand and then very recently released an entire website dedicated to it called Coach Dave Academy. And on there, uh, I, I offer coaching, but I'm now also starting to offer sessions with my engineer because I've also started to realize that 
in iRacing and ACC, a lot of guys want to modify setups to suit their driving style, very much like we do in real life. So I started mm. to rope in my real life engineer into my YouTube streams. Um, so he's in my ear the whole time. And it, at least for me, the, there's, there's two elements of value here. For me, we get to practice and enhance our relationship on the radio, so to speak, so that when we get back to real racing, we haven't yeah. lost contact. So, and we, we're starting to also, cause he's a new engineer for us this year. We're starting to develop a way of working together, but now I'm starting to realize that we, I can also offer his services to, to those in the sim world who also want to do, uh, get a bit of engineering help and it will definitely quite literally up their game. It will improve their game. Well, this is a uh, uh, brilliant. And I think, uh, people watching will start thinking, Hey, David's onto something here. All right, David, are you ready for the quick fire round? Oh, well, you're making a big deal of this. So I'm actually not sure yet. <laughs> I'm actually getting my voice goes more serious. David Perrell, your time starts now. Favorite Grand Prix track to race on? Silverstone. Who is your driving idol? Uh, Valentino Rossi. I know he's on bikes, but he's still my idol. Treadmill or rower in the gym? <gasps> Treadmill. Okay. Is there really petrol in your blood? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. I make people dizzy when favorite... they're around me. <laughs> <laughs> favorite South African food? Biltong. PC, Xbox, or PS4? PS4. Favorite PS4 game? Gran Turismo Sport. Just works most of the time. Scale of one to 10, how cool are you? Oh, six. <laughs> six, okay. Uh, Springbok or Cape Fox? Springbok. <laughs> Best sim racer apart from you? Calvin van der Linde at the moment. Uh, if you could choose any car to own, what would you choose? Ferrari F12 TDF. Okay, what color? Specifically the TDF. Okay. Uh, black or red? Okay. And finally, uh, Max Verstappen or Lando Norris? It's going to be Max, even though I'm friends with Lando. <laughs> okay. No Sorry, worries. Lando. No problem. I'm glad you're apologizing, but I'm sure he didn't hear that because I'm definitely sure his PC just crashed. Uh, listen, uh, David Perrell, uh, we have come to the end of Nitro Nights. I could definitely keep on chatting uh, to you for a lot longer with your sim uh, knowledge. Uh, and what I love about your website, can I just point out that if you want to get the same sim rig as you, uh, you can buy it off your website. So you're very helpful to everyone. Yeah, that's why it's an academy. It's got all the <laughs> things that a sim racer will need indeed well listen david uh, thank you so much best of luck with all the uh, sim races that are coming up uh, just to uh, let guys know uh, at the moment uh, and also for you as well david um the games on sale at the moment you've got the f1 2019 code masters uh, that is a uh, is a great game uh, dirt 2.0 uh, if you like your rallying colin mccray what a game uh, that was on the playstation yeah. love that one and also Motorsport Manager is out now. That is just a great way uh, for you to get some games uh, downloaded all on Steam uh, to pass the time while you're staying safe. Um, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, at Nitro Nights. Uh, just leaves me to say thank you very much to our guest today. Uh, David, I I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. Uh, best of luck getting back uh, to finishing that coffee I saw at one point at the side of your table. <laughs> and uh, thank you. we will catch you. We will catch you guys on Wednesday. Don't miss it. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. And then we'll be back on Friday again. So uh, that's goodbye from Nitro Nights. See you soon.